Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by and welcome to the New Technologies Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, we are recording today's call. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I will turn the call over to Mr. Jason Young, Investor Relations Manager of New Technologies. Mr. Young, please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's conference call to discuss new technologies results for the second quarter 2020. The earnings press release, comp corporate presentation, and financial spreadsheet have been posted on New Investor Relations website. This call is being webcast from the company's IR website, and the replay of the call will be available soon. Please note, today's discussion will contain forward-looking statements made under the safe harbor provisions of the United Private Securities Navigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements involve risk, uncertainties, assumptions, and other factors. The company actual results may be materially different from those expressed today. Further information regarding the risk factors is included in the company's public filings with the Securities and the Exchange Commission. The company does not assume any obligation to update any forward-looking statement, except as required by law. Our earnings press release and this call includes discussions of certain non-GAAP financial measures. The press release contains a uh, definition of non-GAAP financial measures and the reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial results. On the call with me today are our CEO, Dr. Yan Li, and CFO, Mr. Hardy Zhang. Now, let me turn the call over to Yan. and thanks everyone for joining us on the call today. Uh, we have observed the recovery in the China market in Q2, while in the overseas market our sales performance was still affected by COVID-19. Now on performance in Q2, our total sales volume reached 160,000 units, an increase of 61% year over year. The sales volume in the China market reached 255,000 units, an increase of 81% year over year while the international market reached 5,000 units decreased by 62% due to the impact of COVID-19. Despite the decline in sales in the overseas market in Q2, we remain very, very positive about our performance in the second half as the market gradually recovered from the COVID-19 outbreak. Now in Q2, we continue to build our leadership in urban mobility via new product rollout, branding and marketing activities, and the retail expansion. So first of all, Q2 has been a very busy quarter for us in launching new products. As I mentioned in the previous earning call, we launched our MQI2 on May 7th, our flagship electric bicycle product for the China market in 2020, as the upgrade of our 2016 signature M1 model, with the up-to-date technology and complying with China's new regulation. The product launch was held on Jibo or online live streaming sales at Taobao platform and achieved a huge success with 3 million plus views and likes. Since then, M2 has been a key selling product in our electric bicycle category, representing 50.5% of our sales in Q2 and is positioned as our high-end electric bicycle product. We also introduced the MQIS or MS model on July 16th. MS is slightly smaller compared with M2, but also inherited the family design style of M series using the same technology platform as in M2. We also apply our innovation in lightweight materials in MS, reducing the weight of the MS chassis, which allowed us to expand the battery capacity to 48 volt 26 amp hours while still complying with the new regulation. Now with this new battery capacity, the MS has a longer drive range up to 100 kilometers and leads the drive range for the entire electric bicycle industry. Also the compact form factor of MS is also very friendly for people with old height. MS comes with four models with pricing ranging from 3899 to 5599 RMB, 
representing an entry-level product for the M series, while M2 is with price range from $45.99 to $61.99. Now, besides expanding our M series with two new models, M2 and MS, we also expanded our GOA series with three new models, G0, G2, and upgraded G3. G0 is an electric bicycle designed as an entry-level product of the GOA series, targeting the mid-end market with two dry range options at 40 and 60 kilometers, priced at $22.99 and $27.99 RMB. G0 inherited the design style of the GOA series, but is more compact and more practical with building back seats and add-on baby seats. G0 was launched as the JD June, June 18th campaign with a pre-sale warm-up and online live stream event. During the live stream event, we received close to 4 million views and 2 million likes on JD platform, and the entire product launch campaign generated a total sales volume of close to 17,000 units, demonstrating our capability to penetrate the mid-end electric bicycle market. We also launched G2 and upgraded G3 under the GOA series on June 12th and July 18th, respectively. G2 is an electric bicycle product larger than G0 with two drive range options at 60 and 80 kilometers, priced at $35.99 and $39.99 RMB. Now, G3 is an upgraded electric motorcycle product from our last year's G3 announcement, targeting cities with no restriction on motorcycles. It's bigger in size and with faster speed up to 60 km per hour. It is equipped with three battery options and with price range from $42.99 to $64.99 RMB. Now with G0, G1, G2, and G3, our GOA series achieved a full spectrum coverage from an entry-level electric bicycle to electric motorcycle, with price range from $22.99 RMB to $64.99 RMB, meeting a wide range of consumer demand. The entire GOA series will help us to expand our market reach to lower tier cities. Now besides the new products, we continue to enhance our brand awareness via user activity-based viral marketing and targeted marketing. On user activity-based marketing, we had two very interesting events in Q2. First, a new fan from Shanghai spent 261 days riding along the entire border of China with total distance of 30,000 kilometers on our original N scooter. During his trip, the fan rode through the snow mountains go across the Gobi Desert and the challenge the extreme cold temperature of minus 41 degrees Celsius in the northeast China. So this story was published on Weibo and Douyin and then was picked up by all major media across China. It has achieved 35 million views on social media and 10 plus key media coverage with hundreds of article mentions. Now, second, to celebrate a new fifth anniversary, a new fan from Beijing actually sent a new miniature model up to 20,000 meters above the sea level in Inner Mongolia with a hot air balloon and made a vlog capturing the entire event. The vlog has also achieved 41 million views and received 9 million likes on Douyin. Both of those activities demonstrate a strong loyalty of our users to our brand and helped us to further build our brand awareness and brand reputation across a mass consumer base. Third, to promote safe riding, we also launched a no helmet, no ride campaign together with traffic administrative departments across 10 provinces and cities with Weibo articles and Douyin and Kuaishou videos. This campaign generated 24 million views across those platforms. Now with those efforts, we continue to build out our own sites on short video platforms like Douyin and Kuaishou, with Douyin quarterly views increased to 
7 million in Q2, a 23% growth over Q1, and quite shows 4.5 million views in Q2 versus only 190,000 in Q1. Now internationally, despite the impact of COVID-19 virus, we continue to add key opinion leaders to the new crew team of creators. One worth to mention is the Spanish key opinion leader post on YouTube, and his post achieved 1.7 million views, making you a hot topic in Spain. And to further enhance the user experience and engage our new users, we launched a new social feature on our app called My Writing Journey, allowing users to quickly create a long format pictures with the writing geopath to be easily shared in WeChat and within the app. More than 15,000 journeys have been created and published in our new app community. We will continue to add more functions to our app as a means to increase user engagement and build brand loyalty. Now, lastly, a very popular hip hop live competition show called Street Dance of China was launched on July 18 on Youku. It was expected to be one of the hottest shows for the summer in China. We will have two feature advertising in the semi-final and the final during the show, as well as an offline advertising campaign in September when the show is at its final stage. We estimate an overall exposure over 200 million online and 400 million views offline. Not only this will provide a brand awareness exposure, it will also help us to further enhance our brand image as a trending brand leading the urban lifestyle. Supported by the new products, the enhanced customer engagement and brand awareness, we continue to expand our footprint through store expansion and new market entries. Now in China, new added 51 stores to 1,084 stores in Q2, which expect to accelerate the store opening pace in Q3 as the COVID-19 situation recovered in China. For the international market, we have increased our market coverage to 45 countries with three more ads in South America, namely the Dominican Republic, Peru, and Brazil. We added additional 48 flagship and premium stores with total counts reaching 91 flagship and premium stores versus 43 in Q1 despite the COVID-19 situation. Now I will turn to the calls over to Hardy to discuss our financial results. Hardy. Thank you, Yan, and hello, everyone. Our price release contains all the figures and the comparisons you need. We have also uploaded Excel format figures to our IR website for your easy reference. As I review our financial performance, keep in mind that we are referring to the second quarter figures unless I say otherwise and that all monetary figures are RMB unless otherwise noted. Our Q2 sales volume reached 160,000 units, increased by 61% year over year. China sales volume increased by 81% as a result of demand recovery, retail sales network expansion, and new product launch. Our China online sales are particularly worth highlighting. Online sales continues to grow and accounted for 14% of total Q2 sales volume compared with the 2% at the same period last year. The key reason is that this year we launched new products such as M2 and G0 through online platforms. This helps to mitigate the restriction from COVID-19 for any big offline event and also offered a good alternative for customers who are reluctant to go to offline stores. International sales volume decreased by 82% due to the adverse impact from COVID-19. The lower international sales volume had a significant impact on our Q2 financials. For example, in Q2, we have a lower ASP, lower gross margin, and also lower revenues from accessory spare parts. Many of these lines are caused by the lower international sales. We will discuss the impact in details later. We also encourage you to keep this in mind while analyzing our financials. Regarding product mix, as we launched the new products M2, G0, and G2 models in the second quarter, the product mix changed accordingly. 
N-series accounted for around 20% of total volume. M-series accounted for around 20%. U-series accounted for 40%, and Gower series accounted for remaining 20%. The changes in the product mix affected our Q2 revenues and ASP. Total revenues increased by 21.6% to 645 million, in line with the guidance we provided earlier. Revenues from scooters increased by 28% in total, out of which China market increased by 59% and international market decreased by 53%. Our Q2 scooter revenue was, however, negatively affected by the price discount we offered during the new product launch through e-commerce platforms. For example, we offered RMB 500 discount on new model G0. Such price discounts affected our revenue by approximately RMB 10 million in aggregate. But since we offered a price discount, we are able to save on sales and marketing spend, which I will discuss later. Revenues from accessories, spare parts and services decreased by 17% in total, out of which China market increased by 70%. International market decreased by 70%. The decline of international sales is mainly due to lower spare part sales to the sharing operators. Here again, we encourage you to look at China and the international market separately to get a better picture of our business for this quarter. Revenues per scooter, or ASP, decreased by 25%. There are a few key drivers for the decline. First, the lower proportion of scooter sales from international market. The impact on ASP is estimated to be 8.5%. Second, the lower spare part sales from international market, the impact on ASP is around 6.5%. Thirdly, the launch of low price model G0 affected ASP by around 6%. The remaining 4% is mainly due to change in product mix in other models. In summary, out of the 25% ASP decline, 8.5% is due to the lower scooter sales from international market. With the recovery of international market in the coming quarters, we expect this negative impact will be much less going forward. Gross margin was 23%, 0 0.7 percentage points lower than this time last year. The lower margin was mainly due to lower sales of scooter and spare parts from international market which negatively affected our margin by around 5.5% in total. However, we are able to offset majority of such negative impact by cost savings on battery packs, various components, and warranties. Our total operating expense, excluding share-based compensation, were 82 million, increased by 4 million or 4.6% year over year. The increase was mainly caused by higher GN expense of 2 million for tax and surcharge, and a higher R&D expense of 5 million, mainly for higher staff costs. Sales and marketing expenses, however, decreased by 3 million. As percentage of revenue, the sales and marketing expense, excluding share-based compensation, was 6.6% compared with 8.7% in Q2 last year. The decrease of 2.1% was mainly because we moved online our product launch from online, from offline to online, as I discussed earlier. We offered direct pr product discounts to customers, which affected our revenues, but we saved on sales and marketing expenses. Going forward, we may have similar approach for sales and marketing activities, especially with more direct sales through online e-commerce platforms. Our share-based compensation expense will RMB 11 million an increase of 8 million compared with the same period last year due to the new grants to employees during Q3 last year and Q2 this year. Our gap net income was 57 million and adjusted net income was 68 million. Both are higher than Q2 last year. The adjusted net income margin was 10.5%, higher than 10.2% in Q2 last year, mainly due to the lower sales and marketing expenses. We are pleased to return to profitability in this quarter, despite continued impact from COVID-19. Turning to our balance sheet and cash flow, we ended the quarter with RMB 1 billion in cash, 
short-term deposits and short-term investments. Our operating cash flow was positive 338 million because of improved profitability, reduced account receivable, reduced inventory, and increased account payable. Our capital expenditure was 59 million, out of which 39 million for land use right acquisition, 20 million for new store openings in China and the international market, as well as for additional machinery and R&D spending. We had a very healthy balance sheet and a strong cash flow in the second quarter. Now, let's turn to uh, guidance. We expect third quarter revenue to be in the range of 850 to 950 million, an increase of 30% to 45% year over year. In earnings, re earnings release, we also provide you with the update on our July sales volume. China sales volume grew by 64% even though there were very bad weather conditions in China. The massive flooding affected our logistics and the retail sales in July. International sales volume grew by 56% year over year. With that, let's now open the call for any question that you may have for us. Operator, please go ahead. Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press pound or hash key. Once again, it's star followed by 1 to ask your question. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press pound or hash key. We have the first question from the line of Vincent Hugh. Please go ahead. Yen, Hardy, and Jason, uh, congrats on the robust performance, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, I have three questions. First question is about the expansion of product cat category and uh, the related audience. So in July, uh, a new sales close to 68,000 units in China. Uh, can you share with us which models in particular uh, has driven the strong growth, which is about 64%? Uh, second, second question is about uh, can you share uh, have some comments on the cadence of the reopening of the international stores and how should we think about the international unit sales for second half 2020. And third question is about how should we think about the China e-scooter uh, ASP for second half 2020. Will we see a meaningful recovery? Uh, 然后我现在有下面三个问题第一是关于我们在这个低价市场的扩张我们看到我们七月份在国内卖出了这个将近六万八千辆可以向我们分享一下具体你哪些型号在推动这个场景的增长嘛然后第二个问题是关于我们的国
I think for the uh, international market, basically, I think uh, we, we do have a pretty good expectation in terms of Q3 and Q4, partially because, one, uh, all the stores are, uh, all our stores are open uh, so far in all the countries. So uh, it, it looks like, you know, it's back to the business. Um, and the second, we do observe that because of COVID-19 situation that actually uh, across the globe, uh, people start to prefer what they call the individual urban mobility commuting device, uh, which is our basically our product has you know products to electric moped and electric scooters for all intenders. So that was actually uh, a good sign to actually to drive sales. And the lastly, uh, I think we are also uh, uh, planning to roll out in the second half of this year roll out our EUB, our first electric. Um, well, let's call it power assist electric bicycles or the e-bike and there's sort of a European categories as an e-bike. So that product will be rolled out most likely in Q4 this year and that will also help us uh, help, help us into drive a little bit of sales in Q4 and actually also roll over to the 2021. Um, so net to net, I think right now it's um, very positive and we are also start to see orders uh, from sharing operators as well. Uh, as you know, we just recently actually got an opportunity of field orders from sharing operators really to expand their sharing operations in Europe. I think due to a similar basic phenomenon that we observe, they observe very similar phenomenon as due to the COVID-19 situation, people start to using this individual commuting device, whether it's owned or shared. Um, and last, and one more thing we roll out, as we mentioned in the previous call actually, we roll out a, uh, a new rental program in July in Europe. And this program is actually uh, through an app, the user can actually rent a new scooter from uh, participated dealers on a weekly basis, uh, daily basis. And so far we have had more than hundreds of dealers participate uh, in, in this new rental program. And we think this actually will also help to sort of to lower the what they call the entry barriers and give people even a what they call a a cheaper way to try out a new scooter first before making a purchase decision. Uh, so those are all the few things that we're really working hard to uh, to get the international market uh, back on track. Yeah. So that that. My question for question three on the AST, I'll let Hardy to answer that. Sure. For the for the scooter AST, uh, let's first talk about the second quarter AST. The overall AST declined by 25 percent, and as I mentioned, 8.5 percent is because lower international sales. And since July, you see we have already seen a recovery of uh, international market sales. In July, our international market sales grew by 65, 60, uh, 56 percent. China market goes around 64%. So they are growing at a similar speed. Therefore, in Q3, also in the remaining of the year, we believe this 8.5% will not be there anymore. So if you take this 8.5% out, out of this 25%, that gives you remaining 17% that may have a, may last for the remaining of the year. But when we look at the AST, we need to separate them into three categories. One is the China scooter AST, second is overseas uh, scooter AST, and thirdly is the Cedric's Pass AST. So the overseas AST, we believe it will continue to be strong. Uh, in, the, in the second quarter, our overseas uh, scooter AST increased by more than 20%. It's a very strong uh, growth. And for the remaining of the year, because of the uh, order book, we believe our AST will be at least uh, the same as last year, or even have a, a slightly growth. The, the China AST, however, will decline because of the launch of Gover series. The G0 and the G2, their price is uh, lower than the NMU series. Also, the MS newly launched the product in July also has a lower AST compared with M2 launched in the second quarter. So for China scooter, we are thinking uh, anywhere between 15% to 18% AST uh, decrease in the third quarter. For the Fast Spare Pass, there, this, is, uh, this, uh, this, this part we have some uncertainty, mainly because of the overseas uh, sharing operator, how much spare pass they order from us. Uh, currently, for our uh, Q3 uh, forecast, we have been quite conservative in, in, in this part. So in, in short, 
I think uh, uh, well, the, the, the ASP for the overall product will decline for the second half of this year, mainly because of the change in product mix. This is my answer to your third question. Can we move to the next question, sir? Thank you. Hello, Bruce. Yeah. The next question comes from the line of Bing Wang. Please go ahead. Question. Number one is that about the gross margin. I actually found the gross margin quite stable. If possible, can you provide a detail about the um, vehicle or scooter gross margin? And is that increase or decline? And second is about the service. And second is ending one off issue in the uh, gross margin we can um, explain in the second quarter. That's just the uh, second one is that you mentioned that the uh, low material and the past decline or battery decline is the key driver for the margin stabilization. Can you quantify how much from the uh, normal path, how much from the uh, battery, etc.? That's number one question. Number two is about the uh, share based compensation. I uh, actually found that the this one is pretty big in the first half. You just mentioned that you actually offer more or grow more in the second quarter this year. Can I assume this number will be the similar in the future compared to 2019? Uh, how should we think about the share based compensation? That's the second question. And third one is about the volume. You actually provide a, a very good generic number. Can you provide a guidance in the first two weeks of the August? Um, uh, what's the driver for this high growth? Somebody said that in China, because COVID-19 concern, a lot of people actually try to buy the scooters to avoid the public transportation. And do you see this is a key driver? Well, this driver will continue to be strong because the China's COVID-19 seems at good control. So which means um, the growth may be lower. But is there a reason why you have a second half, oh sorry, third quarter only 30 to 45% growth, which is below the 64% in the July? So do you expect the growth to decelerate because the status is lower than the June number? Thank you. Sure. Let me first answer your question on the on the gross margin. Definitely, our gross margin is relatively stable compared with uh, Q Q1 also last year. The key driver is the cost savings. I can pro definitely can provide you sort of breakdown for the for the margin on different components. Uh, for our scooters, uh, if you take out the uh, logistic cost warranty, it's in the second quarter the gross margin is around the seven twenty twenty point seven percent. Compare with uh, compare with uh, last quarter, it's increased by two percent. And if you compare with last year, it has increased by around three uh, percent. So this is a scooter we have a scooter gross margin. For the accessory, accessory and the spare part gross margin is around 48%, it's very similar to what we have in Q1, also in uh, Q2 last year, it's relatively stable. For the service gross margin, this quarter is low, uh, relatively low, only around 30% compared with the 70, 80% in the previous quarter, mainly because in this quarter we have a service revenue coming from Volkswagen uh, project. Uh, you may recall we provide the R&D service to Volkswagen for a new product that they, they plan to launch uh, next year. But because of the COVID-19, the project has to be suspended. Therefore, even though we have the same revenue, we have to incur additional costs, mainly for staff costs. We need to save the team for their for their project. That's why we drag down our service uh, service uh, revenue gross margin. So this is the uh, this is the margin by product line. And specifically on the raw material, how much we save on that? So if we compare with our Q2 raw material uh, procurement cost with the Q2 last year, our battery cell cost actually declined by around 10%. And the battery uh, pack and BMS also have a few percentage decline. Overall, the battery pack, the overall pack battery pack, including both battery cell, BMS, and the pack has a decline of 8% compared with same period, same time last year. The other components on the scooter also have around 4% uh, cost down. Overall, if you calculate by, uh, by, by the weighted average, it contributes to around 5.6% cost down. So this, this, this is really the key driver to help us to uh, make sure our gross margin is relatively stable. And so this is the answer to your first question. And your second question is the share-based compensation. The share-based compensation is mainly because uh, last year in the second, in the 
third quarter in August, we uh, the, the the board approved additional share based compensation for the management team, also for the, some of the key employees. So that strike uh, strike up our SBC uh, cost by around four million. Uh, you, you may recall too last year the SBC is, is around four million per quarter. Uh, so because of the SBC we gave in August last year, that's drive that drive up the SBC size by around four million. And in April this year, because some of the employees their um, uh, share based compensation, pre IPO share based compensation already fully vested, so the company decides to uh, grant that them additional uh, share based compensation and continue to write for additional four years. That also drive up the cost by around uh, three million. So this is the majority of the SBC we granted, and for the remaining of the year, we do not expect any significant further uh, share based compensation to increase. So that's the answer to your second question. The third question is at least to, to your comment, August sales volume. Yeah, I think for the August sales volume uh, growth, we're looking at a multi, uh, multiple factors here. The first factor, will, you know, which is actually the plus side, is actually the back to school, right? So with, uh, with kids back to school, I think that will actually uh, provide a positive, uh, in, you know, uh, basically a catalyst to the market where we think we can actually will drive the volume growth. Um, I think the second is actually, uh, I think being just mentioned, you look at basically our guidance, which is actually uh, the year over year growth uh, in terms of the, I think you mentioned we, we uh, it wasn't really slower than the second quarter, no? The guidance on the, on the third quarter. Higher, 30% to 45 Yeah, it's actually higher than the second quarter. So I think that's, um, what we think the back to school will help us. Second is actually a lot of our new product, when we look at the, as I mentioned, the G2, <coughs> uh, the G0, the G2, the G3, the MS, all those products, basically with first the G0 and the G2 uh, announced in mid-June, the rest is actually in July. So if you think about those products will kick in the effect of this new product will kick in practically in Q3 this year. So typically when we first announce a new product, it usually, you know, we have a, our own ramp up period and also it takes, you know, roughly about a month or so for the market uh, to fully start to accept the product and really ramp up the sales. So I think this, those new products will help us in terms of drive up the August sales. And lastly, I think with a phenomenon we observe, as I mentioned uh, in the call, where with the G0, now we start seeing an early sign of G2, where with G0 and G2, it actually also helped us to penetrate what we call the lower tier cities. Uh, in the market where it used to be, we don't have a perfect product for those markets. And uh, that actually helped us, you know, I think with our store expansion in Q3, uh, those also will contribute in terms of the Q3 growth. Just to add to Yen's comment on August uh, sales trend, and in the first half of August, uh, our sales volume growth maintained at, at least the same speed as what we delivered in July. In the second half of August, uh, we expect the uh, volume growth will accelerate, mainly because we started the new school opening uh, promotion activity from Monday, from, from today. Normally that will drive the volume for the, for the up. Yeah, so that's the answer to, to your question on August, the sales volume growth. But, uh, but I would say that the third quarter guidance only 30 to 45, which is well below the 64 in July and August, right? It's mainly because of the AST. I mean, uh, the, as I said, because we launched the G0, G2, also MS, their AST is, relatively, is lower than the average AST. So this will drag down the AST, but the volume will still be quite uh, quite strong. Okay, lastly, uh, about the COVID-19 impact, because the, I know the second quarter, the whole China actually volume increased by 45% because of COVID-19. So do you see the COVID-19 impact or help will be less going forward because COVID-19 seems to be better controlled in mainland China? Thank you. Yeah, I, th uh, hope, uh, I, I didn't capture the full question, but hopefully I can answer it. I, I think basically now with the COVID-19 impact, we, we saw a full impact in Q1, a little bit in Q2, 
So as of now, I think for China, we're back, you know, effectively, I think we're, we're safe to say we're back to what do you call the pre-COVID-19 market condition or even better because the COVID-19 actually drives quite a lot of people to choose not to take public transportation that really start to move to electric bicycle product in China. So I think in China market, we're actually in a better position, uh, even in a better position than the pre-COVID-19 situation. Uh, I think that was one of the reasons we keep, you know, we're rolling out, you know, multiple new products like uh, this, you know, in, in the last quarter and also in July, and really try to take advantage of this and capture this market growth. I think similarly, I think in Q3, we expect to, you know, to add more stores where because of COVID-19, our Q1 store ads or store expansion, it, it was subpar, you know, because the money construction site was, construction was shut down, so we were not op- able to open a lot of stores. But now we have quite a bit, uh, you know, stores ready to be opened in the backlog, which will happen in Q3. So that will help on the China situation. Now, on the international situation, I think it's actually back to normal. Uh, but the only thing with the international situation is Q3 has traditionally has been a slow quarter for international, especially in Europe, where people take vacations. Still, we expect to, you know, to actually to getting a, you know, a, a faster growth in Europe um, in Q3 to really make up the gap for Q2. Uh, but ha- having said that, keep in mind Q3 typically. You know, there are people taking vacations in Europe, so they're a little bit sluggish into my retail. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have our next question from line uh, Flay Wong. Please go ahead. Good evening, Dr. Li and Hardy. Uh, this is Wang Lei speaking from CACC. So first of all, congratulations on this strong sales despite of the uh, the impact from coronavirus. That's very inspiring for sure. Um, I so basically I have three questions on on financials and some other factors. Um, the, the first question is about the SP of the spare parts. Uh, this was around like um, 800 RMB in the second quarter of 2019, uh, and then dropped to like 500 RMB uh, in the third quarter, and then increased to. Um, 1,200 in the first quarter of 2020, uh, even with the uh, COVID-19 impact in China. So, so what could be the driver that, that makes the key differences that spare parts ASP? That's the uh, that's the first the first question. Um, and, and then the second question is about the uh, the new regulations that we believe uh, will redefine the two-wheeler uh, industry in China. So it seems individual cities are are having different law uh, enforcement strengths. For instance, in Beijing, it seems we have a more uh, restrict environment, while Shanghai uh, is not taking that regulation seriously for now. Um, how do you view the uh, the enforcement uh, in the in the following quarters? That's the that's the second question, and and then uh, the, the the last question and the third question is about the impact from the sharing economy. So, um, looking forward, do we do we think the rising of the sharing economy? Uh, will lead to a negative impact to our sales in the future, or will uh, new become an, a key uh, vehicle suppliers for, for this industry? That's all my questions. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Lee. Let me answer your first question about the spare parts ASP. Then I think we need, need to first talk about the total revenue for uh, accessory spare parts and uh, services. I think the revenue come from two sources. One is the sales from the China market. Uh, mm. Secondly, it's the revenue coming from overseas market. So mm. even though in the second quarter our total revenue from this ca- from this uh, category reduced by 17 percent, but if you mm. see that into international market and also China market, China market actually grew by 70, 70, 70 percent. Overseas mm. market declined by 70, also 70 percent. Mm. So in China, if you uh, calculate the uh, average SP per scooter, the price is actually the SP is actually quite stable. So the mm. decline or the fluctuation is mainly coming from overseas market. So for okay. the overseas market, the key driver for our uh, uh, revenue in this category is the uh, uh, actual battery and some spare parts we sold to sharing operators in the overseas market, in both Europe mm. and also the, in the U.S. This year, because mm. of COVID-19, 
in the, uh, continue to affect U.S., continue to affect uh, Europe. Therefore, we have much less uh, spare parts sold to the overseas market. So that, that mm. is really the driver to um, uh, contribute to the fluctuation of the mm. ASP. So we think this will continue for probably in the next one or two quarter. And we hope next mm. year it become more or more, more less stable. So that's my first question to you, the uh, first question. I will let you again comment on the remaining two questions. Yeah. I think, Lei, I, I think on the um, on the regulations enforcement, um, I, you know, actually agree with you. We do observe different cities actually apply a different uh, what do you call it? You know, enforce it differently. Uh, you know, top cities. What do we observe? Basically, like top twenty, top ten to twenty cities. Actually, top twenty cities. We're talking about Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Nanjing, even Wenzhou. Uh, uh, those cities and, and uh, uh, Hangzhou, those ones, uh, and, and, and uh, Fuzhou, and uh, Guangzhou, mm. Shenzhen, those ones actually they enforce very strictly. And so in those cities, actually, only the electric bicycle products are being sold. And mm. after the top, and those cities roughly represent about, you know, traditionally in terms of market size, they're roughly about 6 million units a year in terms of market size out of that 30 million units total market size annually. Mm -hmm. And then after that 20 cities, I think we're still seeing a handle, you know, cities still enforce the electric bicycle rules. And obviously there are also cities actually that allow electric motorcycles, actually allow motorcycles, so mm -hmm. that the product that didn't fall under the, what do you call the, uh, electric bicycles are being sold at electric motorcycles. Mm. And a little, little bit of caveat on this is actually it's more enforcement. First of all, regardless which city, the enforcement is actually very strictly on manufacturers. Basically, mm. for the product that manufacturer provide, the, the product has to be either complying with the electric bicycle or electric motorcycle. There couldn't be a different, a, a, you know, third category product, which is, you know, not compliant with either regulations. Mm -hmm. So from a manufacturing perspective, as new as any other manufacturer, the product we ship are in either electric bicycle or electric motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And they are being sold as electric bicycle or electric motorcycles. Mm -hmm. I think only the city, city is a little bit loose on this. Our city doesn't require people to get licensed plate on their mm. electric bicycles or electric mm. motorcycles. That's where the enforcement a little bit loose. But, you know, I, I think you know, I gave a really long answer for a short question here. But I think as, as time passes, you're going to see you're going to see more and more cities going to enforce the rules. You know, for mm. example, last year, we didn't see Xuzhou, basically a third tier city mm. in Jiangsu, mm. really enforce this. But this mm. year, Xuzhou basic, you know, this, you know, the Xuzhou actually start offering, you know, require people to get license plates on electric mm. bicycles, you know, mm. practically, uh, you know, basically April, May this year. So you're going to see more and more cities actually will apply the policy. I think the, the reason is slower because it requires quite a bit of administrative effort to establish what they call the license plate pro protocol. You know, getting mm. the you know the local traffic management to set up posts to get bicycles to get like you know license plate registration. Mm. All that. Uh, it takes time, but I think within a couple you know couple couple of years or so, you're gonna see mm. you know, more than city get you know being enforced strictly. So okay, so so it seems not not only to uh, to lobby the the central government, but also we need to take some time to lobby the uh, the local governments. Asking them to implement uh, the uh, <laughs> implementations. It, right? Actually, it doesn't require the lobbying. It, it's really that the the local administrative government actually what do you call it, it has a task force. Yeah. Um, okay. So it, All right. Yeah. So it, 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 it's basically where they, they turn around and see, well, you know, we need to do this now. Do we have the task force ready? Shuzhou didn't do it last year because they didn't feel like they have the task force ready to get over. Mm. You know, to come with what we call the implementation of it, and mm. then this year, is you is ready. You know, join the club. So you're gonna see more see. cities. Mm. Lastly, on the sharing operations, yes, we also observe quite, um, you know, some sharing operations. Mostly still on tier, 
three or tier four, tier five cities. For example, you know, I visit a city called Quanzhou, so I see a lot of sharing with electric bicycle sharing. Uh, there are ones deployed by Halo, there's one deployed by Meituan, uh, and there's mm. electric bicycle sharing operators. Um, we think that's actually complement uh, as, as part of solution for urban mobility. Um, it mm. has little impact to our business uh, because all our products are on the mid-end to high-end product. If you actually look at the, 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 the bikes that sharing operator deployed, it's very simple. It doesn't even have a, what we call a display. Um, minimum plastics, it simply just mm. lets you get by. So we think, mm. you know, if there's a massive of those being deployed in those cities, actually the market segment got hurt the most, probably on the low end side. Mm. I see. So, so basically, they won't won't have uh, uh, impact to our future sales in those lower tier cities, uh, because we are having uh, more advanced products. All right. Yeah. Right. Okay. We that in 2016 or 17 with when they we got those questions in 2016 and 17 when when the what else, sharing bicycles hit its mm. prime. Uh, mm. Currently, the sharing electric bicycles, you know, sort of the, 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 the operation to me basically allows you to ride a little bit longer distance, but other yeah. than that, it's, you know, it's a, it serves the same market, right? Um, all right. Okay. All right. That, that answers all my questions. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lee, and, and thanks, Hardy. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Alex Potter. Please go ahead. Uh, I guess a question, uh, two questions maybe on, on margins. Um, the first one, going back to gross margin, um, obviously the, the cost control uh, that you mentioned was, uh, you know, was really strong. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate specifically on why battery costs and why these component costs are coming down. Is this a function of just cost cuts from your suppliers? Is it because you now have more scale and you're able to negotiate better pricing? Like what specifically is driving the cost declines and is it sustainable? So that's question number one. Um, question number two is on the mix of e-commerce. Um, I know that theoretically at least your e-commerce sales should be higher margin uh, than your sort of traditional in-store retail sales. Was this a driver of, of the gross margin outperformance in the quarter as well? Um, or how, did you, how would you quantify the impact there on margin? Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Thanks Alex. Uh, for, the, for your first question on the gross margin, the way how we negotiate with our um, suppliers is that in the beginning of the year, we agree on our volume and we also agree on the price. And uh, also, we agree on a volume-based discount. So the, the more we purchase from them, the lower discount we can we can get from them. Of course, so this is one of the key drivers why why you see the large volume give us a lot of benefit for cost savings. Uh, then go back to the negotiation early, early the beginning of the year. In the beginning of the year, definitely we need to have a expectation about the raw material for manufacturing uh, battery cells, et cetera, et cetera. Based on that expectation, we negotiated with our suppliers. In China, because of the mass per, uh, capacity built up for the EV segment, also because of declining of some of the raw material costs, therefore, when we negotiated with our supplier in the very beginning of the year, we also negotiated quite aggressive uh, target price for, for, for the for various part of the components. So in, in short, there's two uh, key drivers. One key driver is the overall market how we see the capacity in different components, or how we see the cost of raw material developed for the, for the year. Secondly, it really depends on the volume. It's normally the more uh, volume we have, the lower discount, the, the more discount we can receive from our suppliers. So this is the answer for your first question. For your second question, you are definitely right. And the e-commerce uh, gross margin normally should be higher than the sales through offline if we are, if we are talking about the same uh, product, same model. But in the second quarter, unfortunately, the e-commerce uh, channel is not the key driver for the stable uh, gross margin, mainly because when we launch new products online, we also give discounts uh, on the new products. 
there, therefore, in the second quarter, actually, our e-commerce gross margin was lower than last year, mainly because of the discount we provided to end consumers. But the, in the other, but on the other, other side, we are able to save on the sales and the marketing uh, expenses. But going forward, if we can continue the fast growth on the e-commerce platform with a stable price, no more, no more discount, then definitely e-commerce platform will be one of the key contributors for the margin growth going forward. So this is my answer to your second question. Okay, I'll just a uh, little bit um, add on the, uh, the margin part on the cost cut. Uh, so besides the scale, um, you know, the, the, the annual negotiation, I think there's one more thing within the electric bicycle category that we actually observe very, very interesting because there was a, what do you call a 55 kilogram of weight limitation. So there's a quite a bit of innovation in terms of lightweight materials. For example, if we reduce the chassis weight by half a kilo, but at the same time, we're able to, you know, add that half kilo weight to the battery pack. It will allow us to use a lower density batteries, but achieve the same battery capacity. And by doing so, you know, we have observed a few cases that we are actually able to save 100 or to 200 RMB on per scooter basis. If you look at this on a scooter of four or 5,000, uh, RMB, this is basically 5% savings. So this is actually due to, you know, to figure out where, is it simply, it's a math question, it, it, what do you call it? it's a math question where the total weight is restricted at 55 kilo. So where should I reduce the weight and where should I increase the weight and such that give me a lower cost product at the same performance. So there are a few tricks or innovations we're also doing on, on that domain, which actually helps quite a bit as well. Great, very good, thanks, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Jun Qian. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, this is Xin Qian from City Securities. So um, I have a, question, uh, uh, a couple of questions about the new product. So we just uh, noticed that EIB is also releasing new products, the pedal assist electric bags. Uh, what's your, I was wondering what's your point of view about the niche market and when exactly will your new product uh, launch? And uh, in your opinion, what, the, uh, what size of this market will be in the future? And I have another question about the, uh, the new brand Gova. Uh, can you tell us uh, what's the um, approximate gross profit margins of uh, of the uh, of Gova? Thanks. All right. So, so Chinchu, let me actually talk quickly talk about the first. I assume you mentioned this is a power assisted bicycle, or what we call the pedal like or e bike, basically two li si xing chua, this product category. Um, so, our product we actually announced uh, at a CES this year in January, it's EU, EUB01, and it, this product is targeted European and the United States market. The reason we target it in Europe and the United States market, because market size is, is huge, it basically it's a five, to five million units a year market with average retail ASP of 2,500 US dollars. And that market has been doubled in the last three years and expect it to be double again in the next three or four years. So I think it's actually, and for us to get into that market is actually also very simple. It uses motor. The only thing it has to, it requires the power assist sensors, but in terms of design frame, we, we have all that capability internally. Um, the only caveat with that product for Europe is the power assisted bicycle in Europe there's anti-dumping policy from Europe against China, so that our product has to be locally manufactured in Europe. So we actually able to secure a local manufacturer partner in Europe, and it will help to help us to produce that product in Europe. 
the old we the, this product got a little bit delayed this year because of COVID nineteen situation. Our team couldn't get to Europe. There has to be you know, a lot of on site negotiation, checking the site, all that stuff. So it got a little bit delayed. Um, but hopefully we should be able to get this product out the door in the second half and it will drive a huge future growth for the Europe and the United States market. Uh, this particular product, does, we don't think this product actually have a market in China, uh, particularly because China people actually, the power assisted bicycle is not as friendly as our electric bicycle product. So consumers will actually prefer electric bicycle first over the power assisted ones where you actually require to pedal a bit before you actually have the power output. So hopefully that will answer the the e-bike market, the power assisted bike market. On the Gova, on the Gova brand, uh, before I hand to Mar uh, to Hardy on the gross margin, so we don't view Gova as a second brand. We still view Gova as a Gova series and our NIU brand that will help to leverage our existing sales channel and also leverage mm -hmm. our brand awareness. But on the gross margin, I will let Hardy to answer your question there. Yeah. For Gova, we have a quite wide range of models from T0, T T0 to uh, T2 with different spikes. But it just give you a range, the gross margin for different uh, products. And the Gova theory is anywhere between 13% to 22%, depending on which model, which specs we are talking about. So this is the answer to your uh, second question. Okay. Thanks, Hardy. Thanks, Ian. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more questions in the queue, let me turn the call back to Mr. Lee for closing remarks. All right, thank you, operator, and thank you all for participating on today's call and for your support. So we really appreciate your interest, and we look forward to reporting to you again next quarter on our program. Thank you. Operator? Thank you. Thank you all again. That concludes the call. You may disconnect now. Thank you. Good day.